Good afternoon, Highlanders. Though my schedule precludes me from being with you today, it is my honor to welcome you to this important forum on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, or DEIB. Events such as this strengthen the diverse fabric that makes up the NGIT community. That's because NGIT's diversity is among its greatest strengths and its positive impact on our university cannot be overstated. I am excited for everyone to be at this event today to hear more about the vision for DEIB under the leadership of Dr. David Jones, our inaugural Chief Diversity Officer, and to be in conversation with each other as we work collectively and collaboratively to create a university culture of inclusion and belonging. It has been documented repeatedly that diversity contributes to positive learning outcomes. And work teams that consist of individuals with varied backgrounds, perspectives, ethnicities, races, belief systems, cultures, and social economic statuses are proven to achieve greater results than those that lack such diversity. Learning happens when we are exposed to a broad array of perspectives and have the opportunity to share information and knowledge gathered through our lived experiences. This is evident in what we see every day at NJIT and helps prepare our students to be open-minded, creative, and adaptable when they begin their professional careers. How we respect, treasure, and celebrate our diversity is a badge of honor for NJIT. So I thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, Highlanders. How's everyone doing today? Oh, it's good to see you all. It's good to see you all. Good to be in community. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, President Lim, for your welcome remarks and articulating your commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at NJIT. I've had the pleasure to get to know President Lim over these last few months, and I, and I know how much he wanted to be here today, um, but his schedule did not allow him to be here. But trust me, if he could be here, he would. Uh, we know that in his leadership and the ways in which he carries out the mission of NJIT. I'm also appreciative of his support and leadership as well as the support and leadership of our Board of Trustees members as well. Welcome to our inaugural University Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, Belonging Forum, also known as a DEIB Forum here at NJIT. This forum is in partnership with Student Senate's Multicultural Fest that's happening throughout the day. This will be an annual space to receive DEIB updates and engage with me and other DEIB leaders on campus on related questions, concerns, and highlights. So please look out for this event every spring. I am thrilled to be in community with everyone today, folks that are here in person and also joining with us virtually. This event would not be possible without the support and partnership of President Lim and the President's Council, MTSS, Gourmet Dining, Strategic Communications, the Murray Center for Women in Technology, and Student Senate, and our Associate Director for Student Diversity and Inclusion. It is important to know that today marks the celebration of Holi, which is the arrival of the spring season in India. It is a festival that honors love, and for many it's a festival and festive day to meet others, enjoy one another, practice forgiveness, and repair broken relationships. Holy is an inv invocation for a good spring harvest season. So to all who celebrate, who are joining us today, happy holy. This form marks the start toward a movement of change here at NJIT, where all of us can come together and commit to taking a more active role and responsibility to advancing a culture of equity, inclusion, and belonging. A time in our university culture 
to embody the values of holy, where we meet one another, understand and accept one another, and embrace our differences, enjoy each other, and the diversity each of us bring. It's a space where we can forgive one another, build trust and repair relationships with one another, give each other grace in the mistakes we make in our learning of others and the identities of others, and the identities in which we also share. May we let the holy season be a mindset where we are a collection of diverse journeys in one Highlander community. Will today be the day you join me in this season of renewal at NJIT? Will you join me? Yeah. All right. It's at this time I want to turn your attention to a recent Tech Talks video where President Lim and I had a chance to discuss our thoughts on diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging here at NJIT. Followed by the video, Laura Rios, the Diversity Officer for Student Senate, will introduce to you our keynote speaker for this afternoon, my good friend, Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. Hello, David. How are you this afternoon? Hey, Tech. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. How are you, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. So, David, how does it feel like being the inaugural Chief Diversity Officer on this campus? I'm, I'm truly overjoyed to be part of the Highlander community. Uh, there's so much diversity here within the campus, among our students, even within the city of Newark, that I think the potential for us to create change that is more inclusive and equitable for everyone is, is right at our fingertips. So I'm excited to really dive in and do this work. Yeah, our campus, as you know, is one of the most diverse campus uh, in New Jersey, in the nation, probably in the world too, right. because our diversity is not just ethnic and racial diversity, it's cultural, it's demographic. You know, this diversity brings innovation and entrepreneurial thinking to this campus. Absolutely. Would you like to go grab some tea? Of course, let's do that. So David, you and I, I think we understand the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging right. uh, in an institution like AJIT. Mm -hmm. you know, but for some people, that might be a foreign concept. Uh, you know, being an inaugural chief diversity officer, perhaps you can explain why diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is so important here at NJIT. What does it do to us? Right. Absolutely. It creates a culture where everyone, regardless of their background or identity, can feel that sense of belonging, mm -hmm. be their authentic self, right, in and out of the classroom. We want to be able to see um, experiences for students so that they can thrive as their authentic self. But it also creates a culture that has uh, infrastructure embedded into the fabric of the institution. An institution that exercises diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging well, mm -hmm. that embraces that concept, is a whole model of a very, very successful institution. Absolutely, I would agree. And we can create that here at NJIT. We want to be a model for our neighboring communities, but also be a blueprint for others to follow across higher education and beyond. Well, I, I really look forward to that. You want to uh, stop in a tech cafe? Of course. Okay, great. Let's have some tea. Awesome. Oh, awesome. So how does DEIB, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, how does that help our mission of educating students? So I think it's the cornerstone of our mission, right? You know, we want to be able to create uh, an infrastructure where diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is not just within the residence halls, but it's felt and seen in the wellness center, in the classrooms. How do we ensure that our staff and our faculty are active participants in creating diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives and programs throughout their spaces to ensure our students feel that connectedness on campus? And we want to you know, create a culture where you know, they could be themselves without having to think twice about it, right? We want students to feel comfortable in their own skin, be able to bring their journeys yeah. and experiences to the classroom. So, for example, we want to see faculty create curriculum and content, course content, that is reflective of the student experiences. So students see themselves in the learning process, right? That is a holistic, inclusive learning experience for classroom engagement. You know, many students, okay, they learn by mimicking others. How can our faculty and staff in the DEIB space be a role model for our students? 
Certainly. So one of the things I often do, you know, I, I make sure to share my story, right? Why do I do this work? And what about this work empowers me to create change? And oftentimes that creates spaces for others to want to share as well. Because oftentimes our students don't know where and how to tell their story. And if we as faculty and staff could create those spaces for those stories to be told, it'll, it'll be groundbreaking in terms of how the students experience uh, NJIT. That's, that's wonderful. David, thanks for spending the afternoon with me to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we'll have more conversation on that. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been my pleasure. My pleasure, too. Thank you. Hello, everyone. That was a great video. It's so encouraging to see you know, these conversations coming up, um, I am graduating in May, but I'm really excited to see kind of what the future of NJIT has to hold. Today for our speakers, um, we have Do Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, pronouns he, him, his. He is the middle child and only son of Annette and James Washington and grandson of Elizabeth and Thurman Williams. He serves as the president and founder of the Washington Consulting Group, WCG, WCG was named by The Economist as one of the top 10 global diversity consultants in the world. Dr. Washington has served as an educator, administrator, and consultant for over 38 years. He serves as an invited instructor in the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Lancaster Theological Seminary. He is the president and co-founder of the Social Justice Training Institute and a past president of the American College Personnel Association. He's a member of Omicron Delta Kappa, Golden Key, Alpha Phi Omega, Phi Delta Kappa, and a life member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Reverend Dr. Washington also serves as the pastor of Unity Fellowship Church of Baltimore and is an elder in the Unity Fellowship Church movement. He's the grandfather of eight and great uncle to nine. His hobbies include his grandchildren, cooking, music, laundry, and binge watching TV programs. <laughs> he has been honored as a distinguished alumnus from both Indiana University, Bloomington, and the University of Maryland College Park. Jamie received an honorary doctor of business from Shepherd University in May 2019, and he was awarded an honorary doctor of laws from Wheaton College of Massachusetts in May of 2021. He works every day to help people find the best in themselves and others. He lives by the words of one of his favorite songs sung by the late Mahila Jackson at the funeral of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that he, she, Z, or they are traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. Can we all welcome Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington to the stage. so much you know it's it, 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 it's funny because um, while that is the song those are the words that I live by I wasn't planning to sing it um, but your beautiful introduction and your pause is what invited me into that space so I want to say thank you for that um, the word some of you may have heard that before but it was sung at the funeral of the late 
Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And um, I say that I don't know if it was on that day that the spirit of Dr. King entered me or came alive in me. Um, but my, I've spent my life trying to live out those words, helping to make the world a better place. And today, what we are here to do as an institution, as Highlanders, is live the values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I am so honored to be here, and I appreciate the leadership of President Tech and my dear friend and, br and brother, Dr. David Jones. Come on, let's give them a hand. And the rest of the leadership. Thank you, thank you. Come on, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I want to honor all of you. You know, so what we talk about all the time is the folks who decide to come to things like this. And so I want you just to take a few minutes as we get started. Come on in, students. You're doing great. Just come on in. And you, you're coming in right at the right time. Because what I'm about, about to invite people to do is one of the things that's important about the work is that we look around, particularly in the invited sessions, and see who came. Right, so we want to know who felt like this was important enough an event to show up for. And so, as we are building the foundation of creating a more inclusive and belonging Highlander, we need to know who we're in community with. So take the next 90 seconds and say hi to five people in the room that you don't know. Go ahead, get up and say hello to folks. Go ahead, say hi, make friends. Just say hi, yes, go ahead. 30 more seconds, say hi, say hi, exactly. All right, begin to find a partner. Have a seat, begin to have a seat. Have a seat, thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you very much for doing that and getting us started in that way. So I'm paying close attention. I wanna honor your time and honor the direction of Dr. Jones who told me that I had 30 minutes, right? And so, you know, you never give a black preacher 30 minutes, you know, it's just like, it's just not, you know. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to move right on into our time together. I want you to know that everything that I do, everything that I say is intentional. I intentionally invited you to get up. That wasn't, I wasn't trying to fill time. I'm a black preacher, I can fill time like that, like I said, right? But as we talk about building our capacity for greater inclusion, our work for the next round will require that we start with building relationships. And it starts with moving beyond our comfort zone. How many of you were sitting next to folks that you know? Raise your hand, raise your hand. That's what we kind of do. Now y'all in the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging session. And you came right in and sat down with the folks you knew, right? So what I'm inviting you to do is to pay attention to how often do I move into spaces and build connections beyond that which I know. Does that make sense? There is no magic pill. It will not happen accidentally. We have to deliberately move beyond our comfort zone. And I'm gonna ask you to practice doing that right from the beginning of our experience in the space today. What you'll also notice is that what I'm talking to folks about today is doing the work for the next round. How many of you have been in the workplace for more than five years? Raise your hand. More than 10, 15, look around, look around, 20. Okay, I'm gonna stop there, I'm not going no higher, right? <laughs> what I wanna say, folks, is the reason I'm asking you that is because I've been at this for a minute, and the work that I was doing around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the 80s 
didn't look like the work I needed to do in the 90s. And the work I was doing in the 90s looked different than the work I needed to do in the 2000s. Am I, are you getting what I'm saying? I want you not to be in the space resting on, I know this because I've done this, but to recognize that every round requires a different level of skill, focus, and capacity building. And so as we think about our students, who will be the next generation of leaders who will go out into the world to make a difference, what's the skill set that they need to move us forward that's different than the skill set that I needed when I came out in the 80s? Is that, is that, is that landing? So that's where we're going. And so I want to just um, invite you into a couple of spaces today. I want to start with the land acknowledge, and I join you from the original and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway tribal nations in the Baltimore, Washington area. We know that we're on the Lenape land here in this area. And we start by honoring that. Um, and what I say is, in the 80s when I was doing this work, we weren't doing land acknowledgments. But the land still needed to be acknowledged. But we weren't there yet. Are you getting me? So in the next round, we, are, we, are, we recognize the importance of land acknowledgments. And we recognize the danger of doing land acknowledgments as a performative practice. And what I mean by that is we simply start the session with a land acknowledgement, but have done no work beyond that. And so I want to invite us. I'm excited that many of our institutions and the work that's being done today invites us into honoring the land. But we can't stop there. We must acknowledge the residual impact of that harm, of uh, colonization, and what Native and Indigenous folks are navigating even today as we are um, on the planet. Does that make sense? Labor acknowledgments are also a part of the new lexicon, which honors the labor of those who helped to build our institutions but often didn't have access to them. And so I want to honor the labors of my ancestors and your ancestors, and particularly today, the women. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So on this International Women's Day, I want to honor, I want to bring into the room, I want to invite into the space Elizabeth Williams, my grandmother, who without I could not be standing here today, who cleaned houses so that I could have access to my mother, to the numbers, uh, thousands of women whose names are often not spoken as we start this space today. We honor their labor and the labor of women in this house today. Thank you for what you do every day to make a difference. Honor women. Honor women in the space. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. What I intend to do today is to create the container for deeper levels of authentic conversations. How many of us know we can have honest conversations but not really go there? Like, like, I can be honest without being fully authentic, right? Like, I like that blouse. I wouldn't wear that skirt. Um. <laughs> now, while I didn't lie, I didn't say everything. How many of you know that these conversations can often be the I like that blouse conversation? We often show up in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging conversations just saying what we feel safe to say. What David and uh, President uh, Te Tech is inviting us into is a deeper level of engagement. The leadership here is wanting us to be able to move more authentically. And as we talk about the skills for the next round, you can't, talk, you can't be about DEIB if you can't have honest conversation about it. How many of you have been in a meeting after the meeting? Anybody? <laughs> if you didn't raise your hand, you probably called the meeting. Um, <laughs> Here's what I know, is that often there's a meeting after the meeting because folks don't feel safe to say what they need to say. And what we're wanting to do as we move forward is reduce the need for a meeting after the meeting. We want to create an environment here as Highlanders that will allow us to say the unsaid, to name the uncomfortable. That's a culture shift that we're inviting. I don't say that to pretend like it's easy. 
but that's the road we're on. Does that make sense to you, right? The next thing is to share a couple of important frameworks for doing the work for the next round moving forward and to invite you all into the space of finding your own voice and agency. See, what happens often is we hire an inaugural diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging chief diversity officer. As we do that, what we often can do is point to, well, it's their responsibility. Oh, that's, well, that's why we hired David. Oh, oh that's, you know, that's why we got Chris Simmons. That's why we hired them. That's what they do, right? Um, and what's dangerous about that is that we abdicate our own responsibility and agency to live into the work. So what I want to invite you into is to think about what's my part to make NJIT a more inclusive and welcoming place. Does that land? Turn to the person next to you and ask them, what's your part? Just, just ask the question. Let them be in reflection on what's your part. With that named, I'm going to move through some things pretty quickly, but I think it's important for us to ground ourselves in this. Why are we having this conversation in the context of higher education? The primary role of higher education is to prepare the next generation of leaders. The next generation of leaders will need to have the skills, the capacity, and the abilities to engage effectively within, about, and across difference. If we are turning out students who do not know how to engage effectively, recognizing their own identities and the identities and the experiences of others, then we have failed them. We can't teach them what we don't know. So those of us who serve as faculty and staff in this wonderful opportunity, in this wonderful, what I refer to as a calling of higher education, we have to prepare ourselves so that we can prepare our students. Does that make sense? That's why we're here in this space. With that named, you are already positioned to do that. This is what your vision statement says. I want you to pay attention to, we to be a preeminent public polytech university with local and global impact. You can't do that without doing diversity well. Education is uh, the first bullet under the mission, preparing diverse students to, for positions of leadership and professionals as citizens through innovative curricular, committed faculty, and expansive learning opportunities. Why am I starting here, folks? Because whenever you find folks in the conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, folks often can feel like it's pushing a leftist liberal agenda. You hear, ever hear that? That this is just some liberal shoving your values stuff down our throat. What's important for you to be grounded in, as David talks about the work and the mission and the work that will be moving forward, is when folks are wondering why we spending so much time doing DEIB stuff, tell them because it's in the mission. It's what we say. And then we have the nerve to have it in our values. <laughs> so I remind people all the time, this ain't what I said. This is what y'all say. So if you're talking about civility and you're talking about social responsibility and diversity and excellence, you can't do that if you're not doing DEIB well. So I want it to be grounded in this is who we say we are. Does that make sense? With that name, I want you to consider, repeat this concept after me. Context before content. Context before content. One of the challenges in the work is that folks sometimes try to move to the content too fast. And I want us to understand that context matters. Doing this work, having this conversation here, is different than doing it down the street at Rutgers. It's different than doing it um, up the road at NYU. Am I making sense? So I want you to consider it's different doing it in the English department than it is in the history department, right? So how do I move into the conversation honoring the context? What informs our context? First thing that informs your context is you. Who are you? 
What's been your experience? How conscious are you? How aware are you of your background? How long have you been here? What's your identities that inform how people see you? Do you know that? Do you know that people see you based upon uh, uh, age, based upon gender, based upon race? So who am I? Who am I with? Whoever, who in here has ever been an only? Anybody ever been an only? I'm the only one, right, in my room. How many of you have been a first? I'm the first person in this department to have, right? Pay attention because all of those things matter, informs the context. And as I'm sharing these things, folks, I want you to be grounded in that they're, they're, the context is not to stop you, it's to help you to know where to start, right? So as I'm standing here, I get to know how to start because of the identities that I bring, who I'm with, what's the environment and location of um, New Jersey? What's been the history, present day, and future? So when you think about this work, what's been the history of DEIB in your department? What's been the history of it in, um, at this institution? Is it a reactionary history? Do we only talk about it during International Women's Month, right? Or Black History Month? Or when there's been a crisis or an incident? Or are we living into this every day, right? What's the history? What's going on right now? And what's the future hope for? Some of the challenges are that folks are like, well, what are we trying to do? So can we talk about if this work is successful, what this place would look like, what it would feel like? So I want us together, collectively, to be in a visioning place about moving forward. What's the emotional state? How many folks know that when people um, are not emotionally grounded, it's harder to engage, right? And so emotional state, time and timing. How much time are we investing? And when are we trying to have conversations? What are the power dynamics that are at play? Where you are? And can you talk about that? And what's the quality of your engagement? I share those highlights around context because it is critical that you don't just start talking about DEIB. You just don't enter it. But you consider the context. Maybe you should start with what does everyone deserve before you start talking about race? Because maybe we're not ready to talk about race yet. Is that making sense to you, right? So pay attention to your context. The next thing I want to offer you is that identity does matter. You see there that I have sexual orientation, gender, religion, socioeconomic, ability, nationality, um, and you see race-centered. And I want to talk for a moment about why I say, and I've centered race. One of the challenges of this work in 2023 is that folks want to do DEIB work and not do race. They want to say it's about everything and not do race. And what I want to invite you into understanding is that you cannot do this work well if you will not do race. You cannot do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work if you won't do race. Now, repeat after me. Jamie did not say. Race was all that mattered. Say it again. Jamie did not say. Race was all that mattered. When I show up in a room in this package, you see the package? And I say that you must do race, people often hear that I said race was all that mattered. What I am saying is given our context that we must be equipped and have the capacity to engage across race. Is that landing for you? Are you getting me? Right? Um, and so I'm inviting you into a space where you get to see and ask yourself, how comfortable am I and what has been my experience with engaging race here at NJIT? How do I do race? 
that's something that we must build our capacity to do. But not just race, folks. I want you to hear this. Just like I said, we have to do race. We have to do everything else that's there. But you need to allow intersections and the conversation around all other identities to be a way into race and not a way out of it. Lots of folks have used, well, what about as a way out of race instead of a way into it? Is that making sense to you? So to pay attention to that given our context. And the last thing I'll say about that is, I know that for many of us, um, our backgrounds and experiences are not racialized. We didn't come up, we may not have grown up, even here in the US, we may be first generation immigrant families, and so our primary identity is ethnicity, right, or tribal, and I wanna honor that and I want us to hold that. And in the context of the US, you get raced. And to not understand that will have you not be effective in this conversation. Is that landing? Is that making sense? I, I, I get to, I'm, I may not like it, I may not agree with it, but it's a dynamic that we have to get clear about engaging for the next round. With that, take a look at these things up here. <clears throat> I said the next round. How many of you remember these things? Anybody remember the first iPad? I mean, iPod? Remember iPod, it was such a big deal, right? I was so good, I could put all my music on one thing. How many of you folks remember um, when um, the phones, when you had to text like this um, to, to get, you know, hit the button three times, all those things? I'm sharing this because what I want to invite is the analogy, particularly at a tech institution, that you understand the importance of old technology, right? That technology, when it came out, was cutting edge. Is that right? It may, you know, people were excited. Um, it was wonderful. And if we try to use that technology today, wouldn't we be left behind? Yeah. I believe that many folks are trying to do DEIB work with old technology. And here's what I mean. I don't see color. I just see people as people. Race is a social construct, so we just don't, we don't even really need to talk about it. There's only one race, the human race. Anybody who's heard any of this stuff, I want to hear some snaps in the room. Um, equal, equality is the same, so just treat everybody the same. America's not a melting pot, but a salad bowl. Anybody remember when we got, got to the salad bowl? We were all so excited about being a salad bowl, right? Um, multiculturalism, let's learn about the diverse other. Right? Um, yes, uh, uh, equal opportunity. This myth of meritocracy. Everybody has the same opportunity and chance because we're all here. Rugged individualism. Pull yourself up. Uh, Oprah did it. Obama did it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I can point to someone who was able to do it. My favorite one is um, uh, I'm minoritized in another identity, so I don't need to do race. Right, you know, because you know, I, I know what it's like. I grew up poor, or I know what it's like because I was a woman. I was the first woman in that, so I don't need to do race again. That's old technology, right? And then the last one there is: I have BIPOC friends. I have Black, Indigenous, and people of color friends. My closest friends are, you know, you should you should have been in my wedding. You know, um, you should see where I go to eat every week. You know, all the stuff. So people are confusing proximity with capacity. Just because you've been near one doesn't mean you have the capacity in, to engage. Is, is that landing? So I want us to recognize that these things, just like those old technologies, were cutting edge at a time. They did matter. It was important not to see color at a time because before, <laughs> Are you getting me? You know, so recognize that mattered at a time, and it was. But it is time for an upgrade. Now, how many of you have ever gotten that upgrade notification on your device, and you said, mm -mm, not today. Mm -mm, I don't have time for this, right? You know, right? So, so think about it. So why do people not want to upgrade? 
What, what gets in the way? Just put, a, put it in the room. What? Change. Yes, I don't want to change. What else? Busy. It takes time. It's longer. I'm comfortable with what I know, right? Are you getting me? And so where I want to leave you folks is here are the things that if we're to do this work for the next round, we must be prepared to do. First, we've got to create environments where it's okay not to know, where you can be a learner, where you're not going to get canceled if you misgender someone, where you're not going to get written off if you don't say the word right, whether it's Latinx or whether it's um, Latino or whether it's indigenous. You, I'm not going to get written off if I pronounce the word wrong. I'm not going to, it's not a stupid question if I ask, right? So creating learning environments with a DEIB lens. The second is, what's a common understanding? What's diversity? What's equity? What's inclusion? What's belonging? To be clear as a community around what we mean when we say those words. The purple box says, a focus on DEIB must not be an excuse to not engage race. So everything mattering cannot take out when we need to be doing specifically work through a race lens at the individual, at the group, and at the systems levels. Individual, group, and systems levels. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's an interpersonal level at which we have to engage this racial conversation. How comfortable am I with you and you with me and so on. There's also the group level, which is a place where we begin to see where inequities are showing up. What's happening in tenure and promotion? What's happening in a turnover? What's happening in discipline situations? That's where we begin to see there's a difference in what's happening to our um, Latinx students than what's happening for our black students or than what's happening for white students. So to be able to see what's happening by group membership and then at the systems level is the invitation to see what are our policies, our practices, our procedures, and our cultural norms. Nobody has ever said that these folks can't be in this position, but the culture does not support these folks being in these positions. Are, am I making sense? It just, it just happens. So we have to be willing to pay attention to the patterns. And finally, <clears throat> we must build <coughs> capacity to engage the full range of human emotions. One of the things that given all we've gone through as our collective trauma is that people don't feel like they have the capacity to say it just like you want to hear it. And when folks have felt, I generally say, you know, people don't generally start out yelling. Folks generally get to yelling after they feel like they've not been heard. And if we make their yelling the problem and not why they're yelling, <laughs> then we serve to maintain status quo. Is that making sense to you? So we want to develop space for the full range of human emotions. Sometimes I'm angry, sometimes I'm disappointed, sometimes I'm sad, but sometimes I'm actually showing up with some joy. Can I, can I be joyful, right? And is it safe for me to be glad that something happened? Um, and then to be able to talk about that within community. And the final thing I want to share, folks, is if we're going to do the work for the next round, we must recognize that we have to do our own work. We have to be willing to say, you know, every day when I get up and I go to work, I don't even think about race. What does that mean? And how does that show up in the space? You know, I don't think about accessibility. So I didn't notice that when I came in that the door, the handicap door, wouldn't open. I just pulled it. So I didn't think about it. So I didn't go in and report, you know, to the powers that be, oh, that door is not the accessibility door is not working because I don't have to think about it, right? Um, right? I don't think about what happens for folks and identities that are minoritized that are other than mine. 
And so if we're going to create a space where people feel like they belong, we have to do our own work. The last thing that I will say to you is folks want to do equity, inclusion, and belonging without owning inequity, exclusion, and not belonging. There would be no need for equity and inclusion if there weren't a history of inequity and exclusion. There would be no need for equity and inclusion if there weren't already some people who were already overly included and some who were not. What we must be willing to do is own, where have I always been included? And what does that mean that I get without ever having to think about it or worry about, such that I can then begin to be in the conversation with those who are experiencing exclusion in a different way, with a different sense of empathy, with a different sense of what my agency is to help you feel like you belong. I started this work when I was an undergraduate student back at Slippery Rock State College back in 19, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I was committed to ending racism before I left Slippery Rock. I was going to finish it. Get that all wrapped up. <laughs> You're working on that one. Went on off to graduate school and discovered sexism. Who knew? Um, and so while at Indiana University, I discovered sexism and ways in which, while nuanced as a black man, I still benefited from the patriarchy and the systems that were set up to hear male voices in a different way. I didn't know that, right? I didn't think about that. I was committed to ending that by 1984 as well. I was getting that all out the way as well. I say that to say before we bring up our chief diversity officer is ours may not be to fix it. Ours may simply be to leave it better than we found it. This work didn't start with us and it won't end with us. I am delighted to know that when I sit down from actively doing this work in this way, that I could pass the baton to my brother, Dr. David Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington, for reminding us of all the work that we still have to do. And, um, and if you don't know what part you all have to play here at NJIT, I know a couple people who could help you figure that out. Um, it was such a powerful and moving, thought-provoking keynote. He made it clear why this work is important and how we should all get behind the leadership of Dr. Jones to come together and collectively engage in a culture change process that makes NJIT a more inclusive campus community. We value your time with us and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you our inaugural Chief Diversity Officer, a historic senior leadership position at NJIT. Dr. Jones, he, him, his, is a leading voice for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Dr. Jones is our inaugural Chief Diversity Officer here at New Jersey Institute of Technology. He is the co-founder for the National Association for Student Personnel Administrators, Ujima Institute, and an award-winning higher education professional previously recognized by the National Association for Student Personnel Administrators with the Doris Ching Award for Excellence as a student affairs professional. Dr. Jones is a result-driven diversity executive with nearly 20 years of experience building effective multi-year diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, DEIB strategies, and executing a vision using project management skills as a DEI executive, consultant, coach, teacher, and leader. The son of a father who was born and raised in the segregated South, Dr. Jones's family and personal story influences his commitment to addressing and dismantling systemic inequalities and oppression. Through all his 
contributions to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, Dr. Jones's work is centered on a quote by activist and scholar Dr. Angela Davis, where she says, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Dr. Jones firmly believes we cannot accept the mistreatment and disenfranchisement others experience, particularly those who have been historically marginalized by an unjust society and system, that we must come together across our differences to get into good trouble and create change today for a better tomorrow. He challenges those he meets to learn more about one another, accept one another, and unify against injustice. Born in Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Jones is married to his college sweetheart, Stephanie. David and Stephanie are proud parents to their three young children, Jacob, Sophia, and Natalia. Can everybody welcome Dr. Jones, please? Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is such a delight to be here, and it's, it was such a delight to hear such important, timely, and provocative words from Dr. Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. Thank you so much for, for everything you've, you've done to create a blueprint on how this work should be done. And I once sat as a participant at the Social Justice Training Institute, which Dr. Washington founded. And so to several years later share the stage with you um, in this space it is, is a humbling experience. So thank you. So Dr. Washington really gave us the challenge um, in terms of upgrading right, our work and responsibility in doing diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work. So I'm here to present to you my vision on how we will advance a culture of equity, inclusion, and belonging here at NJIT. I start by joining Dr. Washington in honoring International Women's Day here on March 8th, 2023. Giving honor to the women in my life that came before me, my mother, and the ancestors of my grandmother, my late aunt, my great grandmother, my aunt, my great aunt, who raised my dad in Montgomery, Alabama during the height of the civil rights era, before he moved to Brooklyn, New York. And so I give honor to those women and other women like my, mother, like my father's mother who clean homes as well in the deep south of Montgomery, Alabama and did all she could in a poverty-stricken environment. And so we honor the women that are in this room. We honor the women of NJIT. And we recognize and elevate their voices because their voices and their presence deserves a seat at the table. And I frame this vision talk with you from a quote from Amanda Gorman, who was the youngest inaugural poet in US history, where she says, there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. My Highlander family, we are the change agents that create change moments. We have to be brave enough to see the light to do the work that Dr. Washington just charged us with. May we all be committed to seeing that light and being that light to one another. So I want us to recall the campus climate narrative that all of you all participated in prior to my arrival. I think it's important to name some of the challenges that came out of that report that speak to why this role and this work is being prioritized at this very moment. One, while 70% of all survey respondents were very comfortable or comfortable with the overall climate here at NJIT, a disproportionate number of women and people of color respondents notably indicated they were less comfortable than their men and white counterparts with the climate on the campus, their workplace, and their classrooms. Secondly, 14% of NJIT respondents indicated that they personally had experienced exclusionary, intimidating, offensive, and or hostile co conduct here at NJIT. If that number is greater than zero, we have work to do. And then thirdly, 
53% of faculty instructional staff, 58% of staff, 27% undergraduate students, and 19% graduate or postdoc students indicated that they seriously considered leaving NJIT due to the lack of leadership, limited opportunities for advancement, compensation, teaching styles, academic reasons, lack of social life, commute, financial reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're going to create this sense of belonging and a culture of inclusion grounded in equity, we must address the narrative that came out of this campus climate study. So here are five drivers that are going to move us forward in this work. One is diverse representation, prioritizing a diverse representation here at NJIT so that students can see people that look like them in the workplace environment. Secondly, building on inclusive leadership, curating conscious leaders from the very top of our organization, from board of trustees, all the way throughout the organization. Developing an understanding of why this work is important and going back to the conversation around our identities and building up that self-awareness so that we can have the capacity to serve and create systemic changes within the organization. Thirdly, is building on and creating that sense of belonging that's sustainable, right? So thinking about what are the initiatives that foster that sense of belonging that we can continue on and build upon, right? And engaging in community partnerships. Friends, we are right here in the beautiful city of Newark, New Jersey, that is vibrant and growing and thriving in many different ways. As a diverse institution, right here on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard in Newark, New Jersey, we have the potential to bring that community right here at NJIT and engage in ways that we haven't done before, which is one of the things I'm most excited about. Learning and development, designing inclusive curriculum and pedagogical practices that faculty are focusing in on their discipline and bringing an equitable lens into the ways they teach and build curriculum content. Executing a course in a way that students see themselves in the learning. And then lastly, accountability has to be a driver because we can do one through four, but if we're not holding ourselves accountable to the ways in which we sustain these efforts long after we leave NJIT and building out successes planning and action planning that allows others that come after us to carry the, on the work, then the time that we're spending here and other places doing this work will not be meaningful. So these are five drivers that I'm counting on to lead this work, and I'm asking all of you to join me in that effort. So here are six culturally responsive institutional systemic action steps that I've been able to identify as the key next steps to really changing the culture at NJIT. One is the creation of this inaugural role, which I commend the Board of Trustees. We have Alyssa Carters here today, so I want to thank her for being here, one of our Board of Trustee members. Um, and being able to think about the role that President Lim and his predecessor had in creating this particular position. It's, it's a critical role. It serves at the highest level of the institution, which is not common across higher education, right? So it reporting directly to the president, sitting on the cabinet, having a voice and a seat at the table is going to help create actionable solutions to the systemic inequities that we might see. Secondly, is building an institutional infrastructure, and we will establish the Office of Inclusive Excellence here at NJIT, which will be led by the Chief Diversity Officer, and also in partnership and overseeing the Murray Center for Women in Technology and Student Diversity and Inclusion Engagement. Okay, so that office is currently being designed, and you'll start seeing some things on websites and, and, and branding as we build out the, the next academic year. We will establish the Committee on Inclusive Excellence under University Senate, which was approved at the, the last University Senate meeting. Following this forum, we will be, I'll be working with the deans and vice presidents to identify members for this inaugural committee, which will launch later this spring. Fourth, I'll be partnering with Human Resources to implement employee resource groups, which we launched in February with an initial interest meeting. So we have several, interest, uh, several employee resource groups that have already started. Groups are meeting. And so if you're interested as an employee of the university, please talk to either me or Joe Wilson and Human Resources, and we will be able to point you in the right direction. 
And that is an evolving space. And so while we have employee resource groups for women, while we have employee resource groups for black African-American employees, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, LGBTQ, multiracial, Asian American Pacific Islander, dis persons with disabilities, we are open to other spaces in which members of the NGIT employee community can feel included. Fifth, we'll be collaborating with the Division of Student Affairs to begin discussions and a potential plan to create a bias reporting team for students so that students know how to report bias when they experience bias on campus, whether in the classroom, in the residence hall, or any space in between. We need to make sure that we're conscious of the bias that's happening and we're responsive in a way that helps prevent it in the future and mitigate it in the future. And then lastly, working closely with the, our new director of human, academic human resources to develop initiatives that increases and supports faculty diversity hiring, retention, and engagement. Right? We have to make sure that our faculty is reflective of the students in who we serve in the classroom. And right now, we're missing the mark significantly in various areas. And so we will be doing our part to implement programs to advance the initiatives that will create a more inclusive and representative environment among our faculty here at NJIT. So these are six. There could be more coming, but this is where we're starting, right? And, and I've been in conversation with our leadership to make sure that we are all in alignment with how we can really advance these six action steps moving forward. Now here are 11 forthcoming culturally sustaining institutional initiatives that will come out of the Office of Inclusive Excellence in the near future. One is First Friday Conversations with the Chief Diversity Officer. It will be a space for you to connect with me, ask questions, engage in conversations, and ultimately, as Dr. Washington talked about, building relationships and being a community. We will have Courageous Conversations as a monthly series for faculty and staff to engage in conversations and topics related to diverse, equity, inclusion, and belonging so that you can build your capacity, as Dr. Washington talked about, to effectively go out and do the work and engage in our diverse student population. We will hold an annual diversity, uh, university diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging forum as you are sitting here today. So please look out for this as it continues to evolve year after year. We will work to establish a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service and Learning here on campus, we cannot be on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and not have a program, a day of service, a day of giving back in our own community here in New York, New Jersey. And so we will be working with all of you to partner and establish that for January 24. We will build out a women empowerment circle so that women students here on campus can support one another, can it be mentored by other women faculty and staff, and a sisterhood of relationships can be created so that women students can find a layer of support as they navigate the academic experience here at NJIT and prepare for life after college, particularly working in STEM-related areas. We will have inclusive learning and engagement seminars, right? These will be seminars where we will invite speakers to come in and discuss topics that are related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging scholarship to advance our learning here at the university for faculty. We will work to build out identity-based student organization leadership retreats so that the 20 plus student organizations that are identity-based in which we serve will have a, a safe space to engage with each other, develop leadership skills, and be able to bond over a leadership retreat experience. We will launch an annual lecture, Distinguished Voices for Equity. That will be a program that will be held annually where a distinguished diversity scholar will come and engage with our university community, inviting the Newark community to be part of that experience. That's a great way to be able to engage the community in a partnership where we can all be under the same roof, engaging in an understanding of, of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging related to that particular speaker. We will launch, and we are going to pilot this this year, um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, we will launch BIPOC Lavender pre-commencement ceremonies, right? This is an opportunity for students of color, black, indigenous people of color, 
and the LGBTQ students to come together as part of a pre-commencement ceremony to celebrate the incredible accomplishment of graduating from college. This is a common program across many colleges and universities. When I was at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, we had the annual rites of passage program for our black and Latinx students. And to be at the podium and look out into the sea of, 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 of in the room of diverse, diverse students with their families participating in this pre-commencement ceremony where everyone gets a stole and gets to proudly wear that stole at the main commencement. It's just affirming, affirming experience. And that really brings home the, the, the sense of belonging that we're looking for from the first day of their college experience to their final days as an undergraduate. And while we try to pilot this out in, the, in, this, in this semester, uh, we, we certainly seek your support to see how we can maybe be able to execute it. If not, it will certainly be part of our pre-commencement ceremonies for next year. And the last two are just being able to evolve the pre-existing initiatives that are currently being led by the Murray Center for Women in Technology. And so this center has been around for a long time. They have a rich, rich, rich history and rich, rich programs and initiatives that we want to be able to expand and, and advance, right? And so we will be looking to do that. And I just want to give a shameless plug for the upcoming Women's Leadership Conference that's happening on March 31st. So if you haven't registered for that, please check your emails and go out and register for those, that conference. It's going to be a phenomenal experience. And, and I'm really proud of the work that the Women's Center staff is doing. And then lastly, we will be evolving the pre-existing initiatives led by student diversity and inclusion engagement. And so we are excited to have that as part of the Office of Inclusive Excellence so that students um, can, can, can get a sense of belonging through the programmatic initiatives that will come out of that particular space. Now, these are 11 forthcoming initiatives. I don't want folks to hold me to these all being implemented next year. <laughs> but this is our plan, right? This is our vision. And this is where we want to go. And as Dr. Washington talked about, it's, it's, it's a collective effort. So it's all of our roles and responsibility in being able to carry out this work. Right? I'm just one person. And I was mentioned in my bio, I have three young kids. <laughs> so I got a busy life outside of this work. <laughs> but at the end of the day, because of my own lived experiences and my own journey throughout higher education across the almost 20 years that I've been in this industry, I'm fully committed to this work. And so I name those because I'm going to hold myself accountable to seeing them through. But I ask all of you all to join me in that effort. So here's my call to action. My call to action is to ask all of you to lead with empathy and be an ally and advocate for others as we embark on this work together. It's to commit to learning, commit to growing, and most importantly for a lot of us who have been minoritized by an unjust system is to commit to healing and knowing that you're not alone in that healing process. Another call to action is to champion the change toward greater equity and inclusion. Right? Don't just identify the problem and walk away, but fully engage in the change efforts that you want to see happen. Don't just put the responsibility on somebody else once you identify the problem, but say, hey, I want to join you in this fight toward greater equity and inclusion. Fourth is to engage in courageous conversations. As Dr. Washington started us off by just introducing us to five people, that's something you can do at the start of a meeting, at the start of a program. It's a way to build community, build partnerships and relationships. And to hold ourselves and one another accountable. Because what we say we are going to do, we must be able to carry it out through our actions. And what does that mean to look like? That means that this is not just a nine to five job. We don't turn on the social justice hat and the social, social justice light switch at, at nine o'clock and turn it off at five o'clock. But this is something that we live and breathe every single day if we really want to be about change. So holding us ourselves accountable to that is important. And the last call to action is remembering that we are all in this together. We are all better together and we all have a responsibility. So let's reflect, let's relearn, let's redesign, and let's reimagine what this new era of technology, to connect it back to Dr. Washington, looks like. So who's ready for that upgrade? Who's ready for that upgrade?
And I'll close with the quote that was stated in my bio is that from Dr. Angela Davis, who I had the pleasure of meeting a few years ago. It was a tremendous honor, one of the most memorable highlights of my life. She says, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. None of us can accept sexism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, transphobia, inequitable policies, programs, procedures, hateful language, bigoted colleagues. None of us should be able to accept any of that. And so if we are in spaces where we see those type of actions happening, the time is now to speak up. The time is now to upgrade toward greater equity and inclusion and greater change. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to invite my friend, Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, back to the podium, or back to the stage, rather. And we have a few moments. And we want to be able to engage you all um, with the Q&A. And so we have a microphone at each side. If there is anyone that has questions about anything that we've discussed or highlight, I invite you to uh, go to one of the microphones, and we're, we're here to engage with you. See, who, we, who do we have? Okay. If you're, if you're comfortable doing so, if you could just introduce yourself so that way we can begin to know who's in our community, that would be great. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. It's on. There we go. It's on. My name is Mona. My name is Mona. I'm a student. I'm doing my master's in computer science. And um, do you have a question? So Miss Mona is working the microphone. So Mona's like, what is going on? <laughs> David, I'm just going to start it for you, right? Because uh, somebody's got to stand up and say something. Uh, Reverend Dr. Washington, uh, David, Dr. Jones, um, first of all, I want to thank you for everything that you've done since you've came here. What uh, Dr. Washington, what you said earlier was amazing. Uh, I think it's important that we all uh, get on board with everything that was said because it's enough of saying that we can't and it's a lot of saying that we can do and we've had these conversations and I think uh, what you're going to bring to the table is really going to be transformative to the culture change that we need. Um, I look forward to hopefully getting into the bias reporting incidents with you and, and being able to join in with the Dean of Students because I think that we have a lot to offer each other in being able to promote the reporting of bias incidents because it can't be accepted here or anywhere. So thank you for what you do. We appreciate you. Thank you both. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Kesselman. That's our chief. Okay, excellent. Hi. Uh, I'm Lucy. I work in the library. Um, first of all, thank you, Reverend Dr. Washington yeah. and Dr. Jones, for what you shared today. It was really, really great. Um, I've worked in a few academic institutions and nonprofits, and one thing I've noticed as a trend is that there will be a lot of people sitting in the seats who have either experienced bias. Uh, or fall under one of the identity-based categories, um, and a few uh, others, but typically the people who work on the ground making change are staff, um, and often leadership doesn't get involved other than to tell us all to go to DEIB events. Um, and at some of the institutions I've worked at, leadership has in fact been the problem uh, in certain, like, departments. And so I guess how can we as staff work with that, handle that? What's the best way to encourage people to attend things like this, have those conversations, um, and still keep our jobs? <laughs> well, you named something very important in, um, you, uh, in that last part was, what will it cost me to tell the truth? 
right? Um, and that's real, folks, all day long. And so we honor the truth of this work ain't free. And we have to navigate what we can do and not make ourselves wrong for, I've got three children. And if I'm in an environment where it actually feels like that is what could happen if I show up speaking truth, then I might decide, uh, I can't do that right now. But what I say often is, don't do it alone. Because it's not likely they're going to fire all of y'all. <laughs> so build allies. Build connection. Find others. Who, so, so simply going to lunch. So are you seeing this as a concern? Are you seeing this as a concern? So more than just me seeing the concern and then going to leadership with the energy that says, I believe you wouldn't want this. Think well with and about leaders. Sometimes we're not able to see the full picture and leaders may be showing up in ways that we wish they wouldn't, but often they're navigating pressures that we don't see. And I say that because whenever I'm in rooms with leaders, which I am 90% of the time, I say, how many of you all want your people lying to you? Most of the time, they wouldn't want that. How many of you want your people not to feel like they can tell you the truth? Most of the time, folks, that's not, who they, that's not what they want. And so if you are creating an environment where it is not safe to tell the truth, you need to be checking that out. So we're saying to leaders, check out how people experience you. And we say to those of us who are on the ground trying to move um, institutions along, and feel like leaders are the problem, we want to figure out how do we go to them. And not saying that there's not gonna be any risk because you know, you know, anything worth doing is gonna cost you something. So there may be some risk in it, but you don't have to risk everything um, going it alone. David? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I would agree with what Dr. Washington shared. I will also say that in my conversations with our leadership, since I arrived here on December 1st, there's been an overwhelming response and embracement of the cultural change process that we are about to embark on. And so that's provided me a sense of comfort um, and also a sense of knowing that I'm not alone. Um, you know, people have been um, consistently checking in and asking how they can support this work, um, which has been um, a, a very warm um, feeling for me. Um, I just want to acknowledge just from the sense of leadership, you know, being in this space um, to the president's council and cabinet that are here, if you could just stand and, and be recognized. I think it's important that it it's demonstrates that their commitment in being here, uh, board of trustees member is here, you must stand and be recognized. Um, you know, our, everyone's plates are full. You know, they don't have to be here. I think, you know, it, it demonstrates a commitment beyond just a collegiality with me that they want to be here. Uh, one other thing I will highlight is that um, in June, after the semester concludes, the President Council will be um, participating in a, a diverse equity inclusion belonging workshop that will be facilitated by the Educational Advisory Board, uh, which is a partner with NJIT. And that will be the beginning of ongoing opportunities for us as a council to engage at this in this work at the highest level so that we can be able to meet the folks and who we interact with at, at where they are to ensure that trust is built and authentic spaces are created for these type of conversations to occur and so um, i think we need as we embark on this journey we just we need to be patient with ourselves and each other to know that when change efforts happen it doesn't happen overnight um, but if we're all committed to this journey and this work that we're about to embark on that we'll start to see some positive improvements based on you know how we engage in this work
Thanks for that question. Is there a question here? Anything question here. Try to leave it here. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your speeches today, and thank you so much for presenting all of your information and your um, goals for moving forward. And to sort of piggyback off uh, after the previous question, um, I was just wondering if you had maybe a more concrete framework, and I understand that this is a huge process, right? You're starting to learn the NGIT community, things like that. Um, do you have a framework from which we could work off of, including what Dr. Washington was talking about, which is um, fostering a culture of forgiveness while learning? Mm -hmm. So uh, would you, and, and I know that's really important to learning in general. I've been a teacher in the past. I've been a teacher abroad, um, and I, I work in the Office of Global Initiatives. I'm the assistant director yeah. for study abroad. So this is very important to me, especially because I really want to see a diverse range of students go abroad when they couldn't before. So can you speak to the framework that you could have, especially with the culture of learning, practice, and forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Last, um, last week, I, I held uh, two uh, workshops on unconscious bias for our faculty and staff. And in, in that workshop, I introduced uh, a framework that I've, I've used um, pretty consistently over the last year or so, um, the in inclusive integrity model. Um, it's, a, it's a framework that was identified by Dr. Timothy Fair, um, in which he talks about bringing people through a cycle of realization um, reckoning, uh, restoration, and reform, right? So realizing the, your, your experiences, the experiences of others, the historical truths that are out there around unjust systems, right? Um, and then uh, reckoning with those truths, sitting with those truths, sitting in that discomfort, and becoming comfortable, uncomfortable with those uncomfortable conversations, right? And then working towards a place of restoration, where we can restore trust, and we can start to move toward that change, and then reform being that final um, component of that model where we actually start to redesign structures and systems that speak to um, equity and inclusion and, and how we navigate and continue to work through some of those historical truths that might be present still today. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm happy to share that model with you. Yeah, if you email me, I'll, I'll definitely share it with you. Excellent. Well, I just want to, I'm just going to co-sign on what David has shared. Um, and to, to offer that there are several frameworks mm -hmm. and models for trying to put into practice. Some of you all know those. So I want you also um, to recognize that the wisdom of this work doesn't just sit on this stage. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of this work is in this room. And so I want you all asking each other, so what do you know? What are you trying in your department? What are you knowing in your discipline that has this work? So I want us to be able to do that um, and also to know that we've got content area experts in student life and student affairs. Um, uh, very my friend Chris, we've got content area experts here in, um, in, in, in Dr. Jones's office, but there's content area experts in the room, right? Um, and so to trust those voices as well. Thank you, yeah. We'll, we'll, take, we'll take these two last questions yes. and then I want to be, I want to honor people's time. So thank you. Good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Washington and David, how you opened your speech, especially talking about holy. I am from Indian origin, Indian American, and it's just so very uh, sentimental to see when you talk about holy because I do not hear that if I don't go to my own community and the people and how beautifully you described the true essence of Hobie, that what it represents. So it, it feels good to be represented. It feels very good to be seen. So I just wanted to yes. take a second, take a minute, and yes, really, really yes, yes, say that yes. how it oh, means to me. And I'm sure my, if Reshma is still here, she will feel the same way. Um, the second uh, point, which I just quickly wanted to bring it across, what can I do? on an immediate basis to enhance our DEIB initiative on my day-to-day -day life. The moment I wake up and start going to work and just as an HR professional, you know, you're trained, you're educated to deal with such a sentimental and very um, sensitive uh, uh, topics. You, you are trained to act or perform a certain way, but I just want to understand what I can do on an immediate basis. It could be very small steps to enhance our 
IB initiative. Thank you so much. So the first thing I want to invite um, is say one thank you. And what you just did was what you can do. Beautifully acknowledging the impact of something based upon your identity. So bringing your full self to the room and how that mattered. Um, um, and so honoring and appreciating the work that's being done is a real thing to be done every day. And you did it beautifully, right? So thank you very much for that. Um, as well as creating the space for others to do the same, mm -hmm. right? So um, uh, I had not heard of Holy in the way that it got named today. So it was a wonderful learning. Who learned today? Who learned today? Look around. Look around, right? And so beautifully, it th has me want to go and learn more and find out more. And all of the, all of the um, ideas and concepts around it feel very much aligned with who I am, right? And I, so I want to share it. So learn and share. Mm -hmm. Learn and share. You get to go home and say, guess what I learned today, mm -hmm. right? You know? Um, so that's one of the things that comes up for me. Absolutely. And, and I think it's also... Yeah. It's also important to highlight that we're all still learning and growing yeah. together, right? It's beautiful. You know, you said 38 years, mm -hmm. almost 20 years, 58 years of experience on the stage, and we're still learning and growing together. So exactly. no one is perfect, and this that's work right. is a journey, that's right. and that's why we have to give each other grace. Exactly. But I also think it's important that as you do this work is to develop your consciousness so that when you come into spaces and you are speaking to a diverse audience, that you're as inclusive as you can be so that you can create that sense of affirmation and yes. belonging. And, and, I, and, 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 and as a facilitator of today's, today's forum, you know, I was, I was very intentional about that's right. seeing what was happening around that's me, right? right? In, in terms of today being International Women's Day and, ho and, and the season of Holy, and, and being intentional about how we, we frame that as part of today's discussion. So I, I do thank you for sharing. And so the, the last piece I'll say connected to that is being open to feedback when you get it wrong. Right? So for someone, so like we're in this room and, we're, and we, we appreciate that appreciation, someone else might come up to us afterwards and say, you didn't mention. Right? And so how we can receive that feedback without saying, oh gosh, can I get a break? But receive that feedback with appreciation of wow, okay, now I'll know next time to be in that space as well, see what I can learn. Yeah, thank you. Last one. Last question. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Amber from the Office of Research. Um, firstly, like everyone else stated, I wanted to thank you both for an amazing um, presentation today. And I didn't really have a question, but just uh, wanted to implore all of my colleagues here to, like the people in the room, I think, David, you said this a couple of times, like, thanks for showing up. And sometimes we might start to see the same faces in these programs, right, these DEI programs. And maybe we know a couple colleagues that should be here that weren't here. So. I got up today because I didn't say this last week at the uh, forum that you had last week, but I said I'm going to say it today in that, you know, don't be afraid like me, you know, to necessarily like, hey, did you get the email about David's event this week or next week? Like, don't be afraid to bring it to maybe that colleague who you think can actually benefit from being in the room today. So that's just my charge to all of you. Thank y'all. Y'all were amazing. Thank you. Happy Women's Day. <laughs> well, what I, what I appreciate so much about what you said. You might have remembered from my intention slide, I said, welcome choir. It was welcome choir image. Well, one of the things that often happens when I come into these spaces is I hear, well, you're preaching to the choir. We're not the ones who need to be here. These are the people who need to be here. I'm looking around to see who need to be here. Who knows what I'm talking about, right? Well, um, what, what was just offered so beautifully is one of the things that um, I also bring is I've been a music minister for 40 years. Um, and what I know about the choir is the choir needs rehearsal. <laughs> and sometimes people aren't coming because of the choir's behavior. And so I want to make sure that as you leave here, as a choir member, that you're not going back saying, well, you should have been there. <laughs> but you, wow, I'm so sorry you missed it. Here's what happened. Here's opportunities to keep learning. Pay attention. He named some things that's going to happen so that you show up in a way that invites people to join us and not push people away. Thank you.
Thank you all for, for such a beautiful last 90 minutes. Um, truly enjoyed being with you in this space and, and just sharing my vision and hearing from the remarkable Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. Let's give it up for Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington again. When I, when I called this brother a couple months ago and asked him to do this, he, he, didn't, he didn't think twice. So I really appreciate his, uh, his willingness to travel up to, to Newark, New Jersey and be with us today. Um, and as Amber mentioned, please bring a friend, bring a couple friends next time we engage in this space and let's, let's be able to engage in a space in a way that advances this work. The, the benefit to today is that it was recorded and so for folks that were not able to be here, um, a, a recording will be available um, on our new Office of Inclusive Excellence website. So check that out when, it, when it's available later this spring. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll make sure that as much as we can document these type of experiences, we will uh, without compromising space so that folks can show up and be their authentic self. And so I want to thank you again for your presence, engagement, and attention this afternoon. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., during his time of activism and civil rights engagement, he talked about this urgency of now. Hopefully you all are leaving today with a sense of urgency to bring this back to your departments, to really infiltrate this throughout the campus community so that this work is the fabric of what we do here at NJIT, that it shows up in the residence halls, that it shows up in assessment, that it shows up in admissions, that it shows up in all aspects of university life. And that's truly embracing the idea of inclusive excellence. And so we all have a role, we all have a responsibility. So thank you for being here and let's all get to work. Thank you for the tech folks. Yes, oh, yes, thank you for the tech folks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you.